Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Oh, Welcome. Places, places too, All places. right. We are just going to ask that you uh, remain muted if you're here to watch. Uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. We are so glad you're here today on this Monday. We're um, talking with April Fridges. Uh, she is going to be doing uh, sharing her work with us first here today. We're going to have a discussion and chat more. Um, and you know, this we're so excited to continue this lecture series as part of Southern Allegheny's Museum of Arts exhibition called "The Implications of the Camera," which includes April Fridge's work as well as several talented local and regional artists. Um, and we're just so thrilled that you can all be here today. So without further ado, um, I'm going to be introducing April. Uh, April Fridges is a conceptual artist whose photographic work is created in a darkroom with photosensitive paper, light, and chemistry, uh, integrating traditional photographic darkroom papers with three-dimensional sculpturing methods. Her works relate to image and object, perception, and theory. She has a variety of exhibitions currently on display. You can see her work at the Pittsburgh International Airport if you're going through there anytime soon. Um, she received her MFA in studio art from the University of California, Irvine, and is the BFA program director and associate professor of photography at Point Park University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are so honored to have her work in the exhibition. If you've visited, you've definitely seen it. And it's quite striking when you walk in to see her work shining through the glass. So without further ado, April, welcome. We are so happy you're here. Hi, thanks. All right, so this is the clunky part where I have to start everything. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, thank you for the great introduction, Hannah, and thank you for having me in the show. Um, here I go. Maybe. All right, so I'm going to basically try to describe um, the last three bodies of work with um, CMY RGB Untitled Color being the work that's in the show right now. And Hannah introduced, um, I guess she didn't really introduce the exhibition so much, but um, she introduced the subject of um, putting together these three projects that had to do with early history of photography um sort of this postmodern uh, collection that they have at the museum and then also contemporary photographers that were um, hybridizing this idea of um, early uh, fine art techniques within um, postmodernism within art and sculpture but also very early pictorialist early photography methods um, that were more about sort of a straight photograph um, and it seemed really odd to put like Andy Warhol next to pictorialism because it made my brain kind of hurt. But what, what I feel like this group is doing is uh, the sort of third gallery that I'm, I'm intertwined with, with a lot of local and international artists is that we're, we're having that conversation about integrating interdisciplinary methods with photography. So how does photography fit within sort of the larger vision of not photography itself, but um, fine art, contemporary art, postmodern art, having these conversations about, um, yeah, I think I think not so much the straight photograph anymore. Um, so with my work, I'm always looking at um, some certain aspects with 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 my work. And it's how do we how do we define photography today? Um, and what I find fun about this is I'm also a faculty member at uh, university in Pittsburgh at Point Park University. And Every time my students kind of come into the program, they have this nostalgic vision of what photography is. And, um, you know, there's sort of these, these young scholars that, that are defining the medium kind of as they enter it and how they know it. Um, and they often lament on like a nostalgic past, um, family memories, heirlooms. Um, it's sort of just the redundant narrative. Um, since, since I began teaching in 2005, into contemporary 2021, it still seems to be a lot of our non, especially um, what they think about when they think about photography. 
So I think it's fascinating with students who basically don't print images at all. All these images live on their phones. They don't have family photo albums anymore, that this is sort of their narrative. Um, and I'm not sure if the photo albums are even still a thing today with, with a lot of our young um, millennials, I guess they're called. I don't know what they're called. But I'm constantly asking them to examine the meanings because I'm always thinking about just how young photography is. Um, so it's 195 years old. If you think considerably to, um, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about fiber arts, which is 500,000 years old versus painting. Um, you know, this sort of photography came out around, you know, this sort of modernism where technology is on the rise. Um, and being so young, um, I've taken notice through the history um, and how it's stamped on certain eras, uh, photography itself. And it's kind of incapable of becoming something else. Um, how we think about the medium is sort of stuck within modernism quite a bit. So um, what I'm really interested in my work is sort of the changes brought about uh, to the medium uh, during the advent of digital photography. Um, and questions about how we define photography as a central concern and embracing sort of the new possibilities to the revolution of photography. So starting back when I was in graduate school, um, I came from like a really technical undergrad where, um, you know, proper color balance, straight photography, um, except for my particular professor uh, who mentored me. She was really experimental and really let me kind of go with um, abstraction quite a bit and pushed me a bit into painting as well to sort of understand um, why I was doing what I was doing. I keep saying that if I had known what I'd known in the past, um, I probably would have, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, there were a lot. A lot of photographers doing what I was doing, but I was unaware of them, um, mainly because I had a really technical understanding of the medium. So this is a piece, just a test piece that I made in grad school um, when I was working for an artist, Wally Vashti, who um, works kind of in this style. He's he, he's a mentor to me. Um, and this was an expired uh, an expired piece of paper, I guess, um, in the sense that you couldn't get pure white. You can kind of see it's it's a little yellowed. Um, but I did a test strip on it nonetheless, and um, it was more for myself just to sort of play with the enlarger in the paper and start thinking about um, just like the presence of the paper and what it what it is without a photograph on it. You know, there's no negative, but it's still um, quintessential what you would say is classic photography because it's made in a color dark room, it's analog, and it's used with chemistry and light only. Um, so that's kind of what I was doing with those test strips. So I'm re-examining the art of analog photography and the sort of digital present and kind of going against the grain of these accepted procedures. So um, I'm always thinking about disrupting, augmenting, deforming, and expanding um, kind of what we think a photograph can be when we talk about it. Um, so some of the three kind of things that I'm always looking about is how photography is always um, in within its narrative rectangular, either through the camera when you shoot or in the enlarger or the paper, it's always sort of a rectangular shape. It's static, meaning that it never changes. So, you know, when you put a photograph on a wall, it's always, it's always the same, um, unless it's made to fade or something. <laughs> and then, um, so flat and always dependent on a wall. So those are the kind of narratives that I started out with, um, with Spectator, which uh, started at a residency in 2012. Um, I spent a month in Vermont exploring those ideas in black and white because I didn't have access to the color dark room anymore. So another thing about photography is that these mediums, they're not extinct. Um, they're just harder to find and get access to. Um, so in Vermont, um, I worked in black and white. I built a dark room um, with uh, 50 inch wide chemistry troughs and I just worked with paper and light. And these are sort of the test strips that I gained they go from pure white to pure black. Um, but what happens is when light travels through the paper, it falls off. So if it's going through black, it can't transcend onto the paper. So it becomes white and the white becomes black and then all the gray scales in between. So if you can just imagine thousands of these pieces of paper sort of shredded um, and then uh, by hand and then sort of separated by bins of color palette um, and then you know large pieces of paper dark green paper, which can't be exposed, um, laid out on the floor. This particular, in Vermont, I was limited to eight or nine feet, but then once I moved to Pittsburgh, um, 
I had a dark room that could expand to about 30 feet. Uh, so you can imagine a large piece of paper that's 50 inch wide and I'm sort of dancing over it, kind of like um, Jackson Pollock, you know, uh, splatter paintings. <laughs> um, but really constructing um, the light and making sure that um, what I kind of see the work being before I make it um, ends up becoming this. Um, this particular piece I had fun with, these two, every time I install them, um, my challenge was sort of to make it the same shape over again because they're flexible because it's paper. Um, they can come off the wall, they can roll back up. And every time they're hung, they're never the same. So that breaks up that, that notion of static um, where they're always the same. So this one you'll see a little bit later um, and you'll see it's picked up off the ground because the gallery like it that way. Um, so this is another example of one piece um, that goes from space to space throughout the years. Um, and every time that it's re-shown, it's re-hung, you can kind of see that there's not very much shadows here because I wasn't thinking about that enough at the time. But as I start reconstructing it, you can start to see the shadows within the space taking a presence. So being that the work is only about light, um, the light within the space, which is temporary, um, and the work is temporary because it flattens back out again. So the same piece becomes a different shape. Um, and it becomes site specific, basically. Um, so that's one piece. So you could consider them sculpted photographs, photographs and sculptures, or sculptures from photographs. But um, you know, my, my background is in studio art and uh, photography for undergrad. So um, I'm always thinking about sort of these interdisciplinary practices, even though I may not have the skill set to do them. This is one of those examples of where I worked with a sculptor um, to sort of learn about the medium. And this is like a polymer gypsum um, process. And you know, I started to think now, OK, the photograph doesn't need a wall anymore. It can be a freestanding object. And now you, know, you sort of have this question of like, what is it? Um, some people look at it like um, there's an artist named John Chamberlain who takes like cars and like smashes them on the, um, and they look a lot like folded metal um, and a lot of people think that this is metal so there's a sort of um, misunderstanding about what the object is uh, which I, I enjoy and also um, one thing that I always find really fascinating um, is how curators like Hannah um, will take my work and put it a way that I didn't imagine it, um, which is also a lot of fun um, because that makes it, it continues to break up that staticness that it can be rotated and it can shift and it can be exhibited in many different ways. Um, so somebody who I was thinking a lot about within sculpture is Richard Serra because he's such a big name. But what I really liked about, um, you know, within like architecture and sculpture is how sometimes I can, I feel as though when I see three-dimensional objects, I can see them sort of flattened as well. Richard Serra is a, a prime example of that, where he's sort of studying, uh, he makes very large steel sculptures, um, huge, you can walk through them. Um, and, you know, just a gesture of charcoal and that sort of flatness, but that curve and how it, how it turns into a three dimensional space. So um, I started, you know, constructing a lot of my paper. Um, the way that I imagined a lot of sculptors and um, to be thinking as well um, through studying their work. Um, this is a, an example of, um, you know, some things that I had seen in my life, like where I'm influenced by, you know, contemporary painters and a canvas that I had seen on a wall, but also you can sort of see that where I'm trying to elicit that gesture that Richard Serra creates within his work here. Um, organically uh, as possible with a photograph um, and you know disrupting again that squareness through adding a curve and, and the challenge of a corner uh, which photography tends to avoid in general um yeah uh so i don't have much to say about this piece uh, but i will state that digital photography is also incredibly important um, a lot of this work i will construct in photoshop before i actually have the framer cut it um, just to make sure that everything that I sort of imagine is what it's going to look like. Um, that's a digital rendering. So even though it hopefully looks like it's a real piece. Um, so uh, some bigger pieces. This is a, an example of like a 30 foot long piece that I had made. Um, and here you can see where it, you know, I, I make sure that the paper is sort of it's black as black before it sort of crumbles out into the uh, 
this. This was supposed to be at the Pittsburgh airport, um, which by the way, that show closed, Hannah. Um, it's just bad management on my part that I didn't have my website updated fast enough. Um, but this piece was supposed to be the airport. And I, um, I'm really glad that they didn't go with this because it just really felt dark. Um, and the show was up during COVID and I was just like, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't gonna work. And it also needed multiple people to help me hang this. So um, luckily we went with this next body of work, which is much more cheerful. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm reconsidering the role of light composition materiality in the subject is, is all the things that the work in its entirety becomes when it, when it comes together in a show. Um, I did go back to that color piece later in my studio. That's the same piece, uh, uncrumbled, reflattened, and just sitting in my studio. I love looking at it because, um, you know, it, it reinforces my, my background and the original intent, which was this body of work that I wanted to construct um, when I didn't have access to color, which was my CMY RGB series. And these are um, color print viewing filters. So basically, if, um, if you're in a color dark room, these are them, and you can kind of see through them, um, and you can combine them and mix them. But the sort of purity of the, the uh, color dark room uh, CMY RGB is uh, our primaries that we work with in photography. In black and white, I had the privilege of having a red light and I could see what I was doing under one light. In color, um, you have no light. So everything that I have to sort of line up has to be really precise um, before I turn the lights out and expose the papers. That's always a lot of fun. Um, but also getting the color balance takes several days <laughs> to attain. Um, and we use these filters in the color dark room to do that. So that's just uh, great of them. Um, for color work. So what I'm looking for when I go into the color work is um, continuing to deconstruct the frame, which is always sort of rectangular, but now I'm still looking at these dualities um, where to get blue, you have to subtract yellow. Um, so that's the additive and subtractive. So cyan, magenta, yellow, red, green, and blue. These are, um, as you can see my cursor, to get magenta, you would subtract green. To get blue, you would subtract yellow. That's why they're on top of each other in a grid. So that's, that kind of brought on the color work. I looked back a lot at my, sculpt, my sculpted work and I wasn't really satisfied with the material that I was using. Um, this was that polymer gypsum that I was trained on and it was just like too cumbersome, too hard. Uh, it didn't feel like it felt very uh, thick and chunky, which maybe I'll go back to someday, but not right now. I was really trying to attain these gestures with the color work. Um, that was much more fluid and uh, thin like the paper. So I went on another residency um, in um, 2016 in uh, Mass Mocha, which is a contemporary art museum in Massachusetts, one of the biggest now. It's, it's like three times the size of any museum, um, contemporary museum. Really cool space <clears throat> doing a lot of um, events and they have a residency program that they started, I think it was only in its second year. And I went back for a month and I just studied sculpting um, and I learned a new process along the way and this is um, what's installed currently <laughs> at, the, at the show that we're, we're discussing today um, that derived from um, Massachusetts and then um, two years later into this process um, this material is an epoxy and it's it's connecting the work but it's also allowing to create breaks within the work so it's becoming um, much more interruptive in the photograph which I like a lot so the sculpting material becomes more present. Um, and, uh, you know, where, it, where it's still having that conversation about it being sculptural, but how the sculpture is really taking the essence of the photograph and that, that sort of curve and the light airiness um, of the photographic paper is what I was trying to attain. Um, so that's the visible surface to the sculpting process is what's sort of happening with the, um, epoxy. Um, so 2018 to current, this is not in a show, um, but um, it's uh, where I felt like I was having some institutional issues. Uh, so I really applaud Hannah for not having institutional issues and, and embracing the three-dimensionality of the work um, and the um, temporalness, I guess, the, uh, the fragileness is what I think makes the photograph uh, and the experience um, fun to integrate with. But a lot of museums have a problem with 
um, you know, storage. Uh, and so they pushed me to think a lot more inside of inside of back inside that box, um, which I appreciate. So now I'm sort of sculpting within the frame itself, um, and still like this is three pieces put together, but sort of assembled where they appear to be one. Um, the, the paper curl kind of is nice because you can see the, the brand, you know, Fuji Crystal Archive on the back and it gives exposure to the process. Um, yeah, so I'm still experimenting with this. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, this idea of um, UV and non-UV protection. And so I might play a little bit with the glass and how over time it will continue to um, you know, all, all photographs fade over time as much as we want to believe that 200 years is something we'll get to see. Um, you know, uh, that temporariness is what makes, I think, the work um, fun because it's so rich in color that it feels, um, you know, it doesn't feel like it'll ever fade is kind of the, kind of the hope. Um, but it will change. That, that's the goal. So here you can see that piece off the ground and where the color and the black and white start to have conversation with each other. That's um, meant to be all three of these bodies of work. Um, yeah, and then I don't know, how am I doing, Hannah? You're doing great. You're great on time. I think yeah. we've you know, got a few more minutes and then we'll- okay. Yeah, so yeah, I'll just talk about the current work in progress, um, which I'm working on, which is called In the Absolute Space. And again, I'm looking at um, photography and the history of photography um, and how we um, sort of put it within its sort of limits of what it is defined as today and what it was then. And tintypes is always one of the things that I was interested in um, in regard to um, the limitations of its past. Uh, if you think of a tintype, this is like those old, you know, Western photographs, uh, Civil War, one of a kind, positives on metal. They're always portraits, um, some landscapes, but for the most part, um, they kind of like don't live outside of that, that um, presence. Because the history of photography, I think, was changing so rapidly. I feel like within our history, we haven't had enough time to go back through a lot of the, the technologies and the changes that we've had but also integrating it into digital today. So um, yeah, so this is, you know, prior to COVID, I started this work um, when, you know, I had access to a daycare and um, a summer and I was in a dark room. Um, sort of spending a few months on this process, learning the tintype for one is really difficult. Um, they tend to be really small uh, in your pocket size, but I'm doing 20 by 24, of course. So I have to, make it harder than it really needs to be. Um, but I'm trying to, again, think about that thing that we think about when we think about that, that time in that era, the photograph, um, and also it being a one of a kind image. So I'm not challenging tintypes in the sense that they, they are one of a kind, but in the time that they were invented, um, they depended on the camera. They were, they were coated with collodion, the sort of surface that exposes it and then it was put into a camera and then it was exposed so then you would have to develop that one singular positive image um that made it one of a kind but today you know we have access to digital negatives um and again you know i love that i have a four by five camera behind me but none of this work has ever used a camera and this is another example of that where um i'm i'm sort of defining the medium and thinking about it more as um you know um, a contemporary, a contemporary postmodern look at something that derived from the past um, that has never had a chance to be examined in, in other ways. So the blacks um, and the tintype is what makes the, uh, the black and the aluminum is what makes the rich blacks. And then the collodion is the surface that goes over top that makes all those uh, variant exposures over top. Um, it's a direct positive. And I can be just like in case I missed the technical terms. Um, image exposed, thin sheet of metal coated with dark lacquer enamel. Um, yeah, I used to support the emulsion. It's So you pour the collodion on, you pour the emulsion on, and then you have to sort of equally get around on the plate. Um, so it's a collodion process. And basically 1860s to 1870s is when they were the most popular. And then, um, early 20th century, it, it kind of became a novelty and it's certainly a novelty now. If you still Google tintype today, you'll see um, 
movie stars, you know, in a tintype, but it's always portraiture. And it's just like, it can't leave um, that sort of pictorialist past that Hannah um, is sort of talking about within the earlier works of photography. Um, and this is another example of that newer work. So what I ended up doing um, is I'm thinking about the single image repeated in a way that it's never been able to be done before, I guess, but somebody's done it somewhere, I'm sure. Um, it's just a digital negative where I'm sort of collecting various tones. Um, and I'm using very specific tonalities of grays, uh, just like I do in the black and white and color dark room. I'm very sort of meticulous about the variants of tonality that are going on, um, but they're sort of being piled up and then light is transferring through these, what are called digital negatives. They're basically negatives made on an inkjet and you can, make, you can make them as big as you want now. So now I can kind of think about this process as being um, larger. Um, so the pattern was exposed, like I said, through the digital negatives. Um, and I use studio lighting to expose it too. So that's why there's no, there's no uh, kind of consider it like a glass negative on top. Um, but there's no camera in the dark room, just the chemicals, the lights, and then this sort of digital negative plate that I'm using. And with all these different aluminums, um, the goal once we can get out of COVID with this work is you can kind of start to see that, that this sort of grid pattern is being created. Um, and it's, it's pretty boring uh, just looking at it, I think, within this pattern. But the goal is to start sculpting the metal um, and making these sort of well thought up collages where these sort of verticals and horizontals start to play a role um, with the sculptures on the wall, making it three dimensional. A lot of these are highly reflective gold. Um, white was really interesting because of black made shadows. I was really interested in seeing what white would create with the collodion. Um, and just to see how the collodion reacts on these different surfaces. So um, it's still an experiment. That's why it's called work in progress because it's not done. Um, but um, they are they are still unique, even though the, the pattern's repetitive, just because of the way the collodion is poured. Um, and the influence to this work was, um, if, like, if anybody's seen like Andy Warhol's shadow pieces, um, they're these really large printmaking panels and it's the same shadow over and over and over again, incredibly mundane. Um, but collectively as a group, they start to kind of have this narrative um, and the shadow kind of goes in and out um, because of the process in which that um, it's being laid by hand over and over. Um, yeah, that's it. Perfect, well, um, thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, I gotta stop sharing. You gotta stop sharing and I'm gonna take your so spotlight time. off now. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, April. Um, that was really great to hear and to see more of your practice and your work. Um, and you can see her work in person at the museum and, you know, located in downtown Altoona, Pennsylvania. Um, we also have Heather Brand here and Heather, we, she's going to be sharing a little bit of her work, which you can also see in this exhibition. Um, Heather Brand is currently an assistant professor of art at Allegheny College in Meadville, Meadville Pennsylvania. She earned her, B her MFA in visual studies from the University of Buffalo in Buffalo, New York. Brand's artistic practice centers around the photographic image and its ability to reframe depictions and impressions of what we deem the natural world. Most recently, Brand's work has been included in the traveling exhibitions, depict the traveling exhibition depictions of the li of living at the Art Pavilion in London, um, and she's also, of course, in currently in downtown Altoona with her work. So, without further ado, Heather, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled you're here. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, I can go ahead and share. I think can I? Yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Just popped in that I'm hosting a spotlight. So let's see. I guess you already know who I am. So I'm going to skip this. I am Heather Brand. Finish <laughs> here. And the face is on. Yeah, if you hit the that one, will do it. There we go. Great. Perfect. You can see me and the screen then. All right. So I'm going to sort of start with the most recent work. Um, that's sort of new for the show. So this is the work that you could see in the museum now. And this is um, uh, called Human Geography Version 2, 2.1, I guess. So I, I sort of made a few iterations um, of this work. And this is uh, cameraless photography. Uh, this is 
really attempting to sort of capture sound, um, really sort of leaning into this notion of like what is sort of a latent image and sort of calling back to this idea of like what makes up memories or what do you remember about sort of certain instances. So this is a triptych. Um, one is to sort of represent um, my voice in a conversation, um, one for my partner's voice and one for my daughter's. And I use a small um, uh, Bluetooth speaker to uh, bring it into the dark room. And I have these little sort of vertical rigged frames to hold the um, photographic paper and to play a conversation for um, you know, the length of it. This conversation was about two minutes long um, and sort of make these exposures. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the little, these little uh, circles here are sort of made by that Bluetooth. Um, sort of light that'll sort of turn on. Um, and this is actually a piece that I made specifically for the implications of the, the camera show um, because the other work is quite huge and I've actually been wanting to make um, very sort of, been wanting to make a new iteration of this. So it was kind of great to have this sort of dialogue with Hannah and sort of talk about uh, what the idea behind this uh, show is and how I might be able to sort of remake something from the past. And so then I'll sort of show you where this idea came from and then we'll talk about some of the other work. So this is the Human um, Geographies version one. And this is a piece I made um, so I think back in 2011, actually, uh, this was time lapse photography. Um, my now partner, then uh, boyfriend, has been playing around with these um, digital visualizers for audio. And while reviewing the work, I sort of mentioned that I would love to take uh, sort of time lapse photographs of them. Um, and we're from uh, He's from Western Canada and I'm from upstate New York. And sort of the first thing we saw when we noticed this was um, that they felt very much like um, the topographical maps. And so we locked ourselves in this lighting studio with all of the lights off, except for these um, projectors that each had a visualizer visualizing the conversation that we were having in real time. And then I took um, sort of large format um, time lapse images of them and then scanned them and printed them onto um, transparencies and you can kind of get a better sense of that. But what was really, what we were really trying to do um, was almost like gamify this experience of getting to know each other, I think. And this space here was something that we kept trying to sort of close. Uh, in a very poetic way, I really adore that the images that are now like of a sort of family portrait are very like enmeshed, right? They're all kind of on top of each other versus the sort of like early version of like recording a conversation and turning into something visual. There's kind of this like little gap where things can't quite meet up. I kind of um, like that observation. So this is a, um, an experiment that I sort of made um, after the, um, this first version here, I guess this is version one, this is one and a half maybe, uh, by myself and sort of speaking into um, a recorder that then was sort of playing in a um, dark room or in a um, booth sort of next to me. So I was like a bit of a distance away um, and sort of it was a live recording, right? And so sort of these speakers were sort of had this piece of paper wiggling. Um, and made these imprints. They feel very much like bodies to me. So uh, these are very small as well. They're about four by six. Now I'm a little bit thinner than that, about four by five. Um, so this is a the sort of in-between work from this to this. I lied, I'm not kind of going chronologically. I'm kind of going however my, my brain goes when I think about the work. And then um, to the most recent work that's that you could see sort of on the walls of the exhibition now. Um, even though I think the practice that I have adopted since starting this work in 2011, um, at really strictly as a collaboration, is now more in line with what you would consider like straight photography, I still am thinking about these themes of containment and this idea of um, really the frame and like how much I hate it, but can't stop working with it. Like I'm obsessed with trying to make it like this tidy frame and being frustrated that I can't. And um, 
it's this sort of love-hate relationship. So I had proposed a project um, about the same time period and then like 2012 and then ended up going in 2014 um, to a residency in, um, in Kilpis Yarvi um, called Ars Bioarctica. And I wanted to make these sort of time-lapse uh, <laughs> Uh, depictions of like bushes or something that might be like growing and moving during the day. And uh, I was awarded the residency and I was really excited, except for the, the time slot that was available. It was a sort of daylight, um, 24 hours a day. And I had um, maybe not necessarily planned appropriately to bring all of the photochemistry I needed to kind of live for like a couple of months in the Arctic without a lot of supplies um, to make it happen. And so I made this body of work um, while I was there as sort of an improv of uh, contact printing um, and sort of this eco dye process that was a sort of slow learning curve for me to figure out how to do. Um, and so this I, I call residue. And I had sort of collected all of these leaves from a fallen birch tree in sort of the forest near me and would roll them up in these sort of scraps of cotton um, they're actually pillowcases, and then leave them in the sun for days. Um, but right, like if I was to do this in Pennsylvania, this would probably have to happen over like a month <laughs> because if it's daylight 24 seven, like the exposure times are so different, right? And then what you would do is kind of boil them um, sort of like in a little steamer, but not submerge them necessarily in water and then sort of cure them or fix them. Um, and this, uh, turned out to make these really beautiful sort of contact prints of leaves, right? And some of them are kind of brownish, some of them have turned sort of bluish. And um, these are actually some old photographs of them from when I first took them. And I know that the photographs I took to document them for Hannah and how they look in the gallery might be a little bit different. They're not quite as wrinkly actually right now <laughs> in the gallery. Um, so this is some of the, the process that the sort of laying it out on the the fabric here. And then this is the sort of what it would look like after um, after the exposure process and then after being steamed. And then this is this um, sort of fixer, another artist that happened to be at the residency about the same time. I had mentioned um, soaking rusty nails in vinegar um, would make a really nice, um, well, she kept calling it a developer, but I think it really sort of act did more as a fixer. Well, it kind of did both, right? Um, and so after I'd steam it, that's, I would soak it in that. And you can see this sort of line here, where it's sort of beginning to sort of react with sort of left behind steaming residue. And I mean, that's why I call the, the piece residue, right? Um, and I think the similarities between this piece, um, this residue collection and the human geographies piece, for me really is that I'm overusing it, I think, but this sort of latent presence of something, right? This image that is like nothing until combined with something else, which really gets to sort of, I mean, I guess the heart of like basic darkroom chemistry, or maybe the poetry of basic darkroom uh, chemistry. Uh, but this work, I typically don't show it in relationship to photography, right? And I think, I mean, I know. I've sensed a little bit of this in April's talk here, this idea that a lot of this work that's sort of cameraless is like fun stuff that I, I might use as an experiment to sort of talk about um, something that's parallel to photography, but sort of outside of those, those bounds. Um, and I, I know for my personal <laughs> artistic practice, I tend to, to use that um, descriptor of I'm an artist and photographer very begrudgingly, right? That it's like, I'm, I can't just be an artist. I have to like talk about the sort of um, definition of sort of the role of definition there. Um, and so I usually don't, if I was to show this work and, and in the past it's sort of been shown in sort of textile work or sort of fiber work. Um, and so I was really excited uh, when Hannah was talking about this in relationship to photography and the like implications of the camera or maybe the, absence of um, in, in some some cases using sort of tools adjacent to. Um, 
I speak about myself outside of this work because this is um, sort of the work that I've been sort of showing or talking about most frequently in relationship to sort of my personal practice. Um, sometimes I think of this work that's like cameraless as kind of like the B-roll like the sort of supporting cast is where this might be like the main character of the, the show. So a lot of my practice um, is about these, like Hannah mentioned in my artist statement, these depictions of nature. And typically in, um, I try to really incorporate these rules of straight photography of just observing, um, in many cases, a confusing or bizarre situation that sort of already has a depiction of um, something that was or is living and then, um, reframing that and bringing it back and thinking about the role that these images have in um, sort of education and sort of reshaping what we think of as part of nature. So the images that you see here are part of a, a series that I've titled Dual Landscape and they are photographs um, that I took as part of a residency a few years ago and they are shot at the, um, National History, the Royal Natural History Museum in Paris and these are photos of photos so those are purples and the pinks these are just from sun bleaching um, and I mean you know especially in my photography one class if students sort of see this work um, as it's been sort of exhibited on campus, they'll say, oh, how did you Photoshop that? Or, oh, I wanna, so they get a similar effect. And that's a conversation that I'm really interested in is this like way that our editing tools um, sort of reshaped how we understand what is possible in vision or in nature and all of that. And um, most recently I've been working on a series of sort of stock image collages that I think I think I'm calling these all part of the same series. And this is very, very recent. Um, I think I'm calling these all like lawn ornaments. I'm um, thinking a lot about this like domestication of plants, right? Sort of impressions that they leave, which is related to the residue project too. Um, and I would sort of start with one photograph from sort of a stock, free stock website, um, or free stock image website, and then keep editing it in Photoshop like pushing it out of the photographic or immediately recognizable as a photograph and then printing it on watercolor paper and then trying to make them kind of look similar through like drawing or um, my daughter's also added some, some moments here that she's wanted to make sure I would always remember. So that's um, part of my quarantine experience as well. Is, remembering not to leave sketches on my desk um, for any length of time, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I think it's quite interesting, right? This idea of like, what does, a, you know, what do you sort of occupy your time with in this sort of stuck moments, right? I think thinking about nature and containment, um, maybe getting quite uh, obsessed might be too strong of a word, with this like maintenance of like my lawn and his <laughs> monotony of looking at this like little plot of land and thinking like, why, why is this a thing that we do, right? And then lamenting all of the, my poor dead house plants that I can't quite keep alive. And incorporating some of these back here these sort of uh, false artificial um, flowers in some sort of time-lapse collages as well. I don't know, maybe this work is shifting into a, uh, more closely related to the residue project than I thought. I was originally thinking this might be a stretch to try to tie them together thematically, but um, maybe come in kind of full circle with them. So that's the last 12 years, 10 years. I've done other stuff too, I guess, but those were the highlights. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. If you, I, we, I appreciate that so much. It was wonderful to see your work and what you've been working on most recently. Um, we're going to go into gallery mode here. Um, and what we're going to do now is questions and have a little Q&A with the artists. So if you want to type your questions into the chat there, um, I will be sharing that with both April and Heather as we go forward. So we've got about 15 minutes for discussion. So I have, a, I have some questions as you guys start to write in the chat. So um, the world is kind of right now, you know, we're in this kind of digital space existing. 
the world is translating art through photography now more than ever. So we're seeing, you know, more Instagram, more, you know, Google museums, more virtual tours. Um, what's it like to stand in front of your work and, and how is that experience going from physically being in front of your work to then translating it back to a digital or to a digital system when you're using these kind of analog and historic processes? Also, you both have four by five cameras in your uh, in your frame. Really? Even though both of you are have this work is not camera based at all, which is really fun. <laughs> No, so. I'm teaching it. I'm actually teaching you camera right now. So that's why it's in my background. Otherwise it would be packed up. Um, but yeah, it's, it I'm is interesting to have that conversation. <laughs> Are you as well? Yes. It's very weird making demo videos for an online class using a four by five. And it's just for them to know the history, right? They're not, they don't each have their own four by five. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Our, cam our students do. It's interesting <laughs> how they're, they're actually going through the technical process with me. Oh, so I'm, I'm, I have to like have it on. And I'm like, and they're like, where's this button? I'm like, and I have to pull up a, a, an image because every brand is different <laughs> of, of their particular brand. It's been a lot of fun. But yes, um, Hannah, the question was um, translating between work. analog and um, yeah. So I think, I think that's what my work has always been about. If you go even further into my past, you'll see like um, a documentary project that I did um, while in graduate school at UC Irvine. And, um, I come from this sort of like um, the Joseph Kasuth school, literally, where we're asking about the chair, like the definition of a chair. Here's an actual chair and here's a photograph of a chair, you know, and how, how do we talk about this one thing and through these different modes of looking. So um, when I'm making my work, 90% of the time is digital. Um, the stuff that I'm going to be sculpting that I talked about, the tintypes, for example, will be sculpted digitally before it goes to a fabricator to be three-dimensionally, you know, whenever that happens. Um, so uh, even like um, splicing film, like it helps me a lot through the mediums in which I'm unfamiliar with, like going back to analog, um, working with 16 millimeter, um, you know, I had all these reels. I was like, I don't know how to time film. Um, I knew how to expose it, you know, but um, so what I ended up doing is I, I just I just recorded it with a digital camcorder at the same frames per second. And then I'm splicing digitally before I actually put my hand on anything. And that seems to be um, a theme in my work, like the sort of precision and accuracy uh, comes like probably from my dad, you know, like measure twice, cut once, you know, sort of thing, right? Like, so I'm always, um, and even when I teach four by five, that sort of meticulous nature of step-by-step -step process, because something can get kind of messed up any way along the way um so it helps me it informs me quite a bit um and you know i think i don't know how i could think about analog without a digital presence if that makes any sense because that's the conversation that my work is all about um but there's other things like um like the luminosity on my work like why why people ask me like why is it a color dark room and not just an inkjet um, and the, the big difference is the silver that's on the surface, you know, silver reflects very differently than, than ink. Um, you just can't produce certain things um, with, with, with the, within the own, your own medium, for example. So a lot of, Hannah, you know, this coming from the school, like this, this idea that the concept is always a photograph doesn't, doesn't really fly with me. Um, you know, the, the concept has to come first and then the medium kind of has to set its precedence around the idea and how you can best inform that idea through um, with my with what I do more of a uh, lens based practice I'll say that's why I, we always say it's a hard to say photographer because um, it does translate differently depending on the project that I'm working on anyway that's my answer <laughs> go ahead sorry. I like the lens based I think I I think my artist website still says I'm a lens based artist and I feel like I for a really really long time had to start every artist talk with explaining what that means. And um, I think I'm always working on like a bunch of different things. I really enjoy working on like the, the projects that are like me just with my digital camera in the world, photographing, coming back, wanting to like print those out large scale. And like, be, I like the immediacy of like what I know I wanted to look like. And then I also uh, like the idea of this back and forth conversation, right? It's like knowing that the medium can do a bunch of different things that I can sort of go into the world, observe something, make the photograph and the print look 
just like how I observed it. But then I can also have a sort of ping ponging back and forth of, ooh, wouldn't it be interesting if, <laughs> and then playing with like really manipulating the image and then manipulating and editing. Um, and I guess just for me, it's, for me, the, it's so different now in the, the sort of COVID online gallery thing. It's like for the, the early human geography project where it's like these six foot long, you know, three foot high or two foot high sort of prints on um, transparency, the scale and the number of the prints it was because I, like, I wanted to see this thing take up space. Like I, I wanted it to not just be this weird digital file a digital conversion of an analog like it was just so many steps removed that it felt very like um there's a self-consciousness of like legitimacy like I wanted it to be a big thing that sort of took up time to sort of walk through and I think that that was important because it was it is a time-based sort of piece right um I don't know if I have that same sort of need to see things as like installation um right now but I also I wanted it to be there uh, it is very weird right now with working on sort of paintings and drawings over top of highly manipulated or edited images in Photoshop, knowing that I'm going to then rescan those in and sort of show them again as a digital thing. It's like this weird <laughs> step. I don't know why I even need to make them paintings in real life. And I was just um, say that in a studio visit yesterday. Maybe I'll just start photoshopping them only and doing that. I don't know. Um, but I think my practice has been also really informed by how I um, teach photography at sort of the intro level at Allegheny. So we teach photography um, hybrid right from the beginning, right? So we teach darkroom and digital right alongside each other and how to these students who kind of stand a component added in or sort of documenting processes digitally and then going back and like happens I think pretty naturally with my students is like the students who make projects that are using film and then printed in the darkroom, they have this real sort of like, this is better than your project that's digitally shot, right? And I think that there's a time and place for both. And I don't think one is necessarily superior, but it's quite interesting that that's pretty built in. Um, awesome, thank you so much. Thank you both for answering that question. Um, quick question. So we have one in the chat. If you guys want to post in the chat, we've got a few more minutes for questions. Greta asked, um, so I'm not totally clear how sound is captured on the photo paper. Could you clarify? So um, yeah. yeah, if you'll take that away, Heather. Yeah. So <laughs> the sound is wiggling the paper. So this is, this is the scene, especially for the, the version two, the one that's in the gallery now or in the museum now is there's a frame, like a frame that would typically be like this with photo paper on it and right the enlarger would shine light on it. And I've sort of ribbed them to be up like this. And then I have this really powerful little Bluetooth speaker and the frame is hollow inside and it's just wiggling the paper around a lot. So it's like controlling sort of the clarity of the edge and um, sort of sometimes sort of the bottom of the paper is quite exposed because it's like, depending on how you speak or laughter in some cases. So laughter has these really soft edges and like really stern voices or really deep voices sort of like move the paper out. And so I noticed there's like really dark lines at the bottom. So it's just movement. It's not, it's not that sophisticated of a process, right? It's just this idea of a light shining quite literally down um, as there's movement that's being created by the sound. Um, the pieces that are the big transparency pieces, that was like a projection on a wall of an audio visualizer. So like think like a screensaver that like when you play music, it's like 
changes with the music um, that each of us had sort of controls over. So we were each at a laptop with a projector able to kind of move around our audio visualizer sort of cues. And then that was just a, like a long time lapse. So it's me in a dark room with these vertical frames with really, really, really loud laughter from a two-year-old, wiggling paper, like just like jumping around um, and then like maintenance staff wondering if I'm okay and like knocking on the dark room door asking if I could come out. It's kind of a bizarre scene. So, so it's the vibrations of the paper that are yeah. the vibrations of the sound going through, hitting the paper, causing the paper to move, which then yeah. changes how the light is interacting with the yeah. light sensitive paper. Yeah, exactly. And each conversation, um, I, I've attempted to sort of find like an aperture and timing for the exposure that allowed the entire conversation to play. So, you know, it's varying lengths of time for sort of each exposure. Great, great question. Um, if there are any more questions, oh, and then Greta asked, and then you develop the image on the paper. Yes, yep, and then I just run it through the regular process. There's nothing, um, there's no uh, special intervention. I just then develop it and that's it. So I just have a regular and larger um, without a negative in it. Um, it's sort of, it's pulled back quite a bit, so it's, quite high up just to allow for the devices to, to all be underneath it. And um, yeah, that's it. I say that's it. It's sort of a uh, non-traditional way <laughs> taking a picture of a conversation. Yeah. Um, you, you both kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, and I just kind of think this might be a good place to end it here. So how do you occupy your time in this moment with COVID impacting creativity with there being, you know, changes in your studio practice. Um, and, and perhaps in both of that, in, in that you're both educators and, you know, there's perhaps some influence in teaching and how you're kind of translating this material all the time and churning through it. So if you two could both kind of talk about that, I know we only have a couple minutes, um, but go ahead, April and Heather, if you would answer those kind of questions. Yeah, traditionally, like in a school year, it's it's kind of impossible for me to make anything anyway, just because it's like so intensive. Either on a residency or in a dark room where I'm learning a new process, I usually go through two stages, sort of this creation stage and then the sort of post-production stage is what I call it. So for instance, the tintypes have already been through that initial stage and then I take a lot of time and I think usually during the semester, I have a lot of energy and, and um, you know, uh, meeting people, having discussions about it, curators talk about it, uh, these studio visits, that has been affected quite a bit. Um, I was supposed to have a sabbatical last semester, but in the fall, but I deferred it to this upcoming fall. So hopefully I can kind of gain that time back. Um, it, luckily, you know, everything's been delayed. Um, I've been fortunate to have exhibitions, I think, in, in, this, in this moment. I think it's very difficult for any artist to have a show. So to have some in a time when I have nearly no time to make anything, let alone think about having an exhibition. It's really wonderful to allow my work to go through that stage of exhibition while I'm sort of contemplating the next stage. So come fall, um, I'll, re I'll resolve the rest and, and I'll just kind of go full force on the technical um, aspects of, of, of accomplishing the next series before I take it to the gallery and then, they, and then we continue the conversation and, and where it's going from there. So it's just, it just continues to build. Um, I think COVID has just quite blatantly slowed it down quite a bit, that's all. Yeah, I'll echo quite a bit of that, the slowing down or sort of interrupting the process. I think that uh, I do like to sort of batch work on things. Like if I really wanna sort of use my four by five and like shoot a lot, I'll just like wanna do that quite a bit um, and then sort of go through the sort of scanning and batches and editing and batches and, and all of that. I think that having a lot of time and sort of a home um, versus like in a, maybe a studio on campus or in sort of print labs or um, dark rooms has sort of given me the freedom to kind of use the materials that I wouldn't normally. I don't normally use paint or magic markers or crayons on photographs. Um, and 
And most of that is sort of spurred by really trying to like put myself in the position of many of my students. I taught a junior son um, right as we sort of transitioned to online learning and was, you know, had 19 juniors who were asked to make a body of work who are now removed from their studio spaces. And I tried to kind of just like put myself in their position, right? Like how now do you communicate this idea that you had, but maybe in this very tiny new sort of condensed space. So just trying to decide what, what is to be learned from those restrictions. I don't know. You know I think I usually get a lot but I think the best that we can do at this point is like kind of absorb the conversations that's happening at school, which is really nice that we're kind of always bouncing this sort of contemporary ideas of the medium, just to kind of have that dialogue when, in, the, in those time spans that you can't produce. It's just right. you know, short, short spurts of time doesn't really reveal much for me in terms of partaking on a new project. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you both okay. so much. That yeah. is a great place to wrap it up. Uh, thank you everyone for joining yeah. us today. We are so excited um, to both to have them talking more about their work, but also to have their work at the museum. Um, next week, we will actually conclude our lecture series with a talk with Jessica Beck, who is the Milton Fine Curator of Fine Arts at the Warhol. We're gonna be talking about the role of replication in pop art and the exhibition that, that is part of this that really dives into reproductibility in art and how you know silk screen printing and all of that got uh, in together. So we are excited for that. That'll be our last one next week, Monday at 12.30 PM. Uh, you can join us there and thank you for joining us today. Have a great start to your week, everybody. Bye. Bye, thanks again for having me. Thank you, everyone. Bye.